Armageddon, the war to end all wars. These words stir up images of inevitable conflict, the final focus on the dark side of human nature, the ultimate catharsis that ushers in the age of peace. All of these issues come to head in the War Scroll, a text that describes the eschatological battle in gory detail as righteousness is fully victorious and evil is forever destroyed. This vivid account gives us insight into how, at about the time of Jesus, some Jews conceived of Armageddon. And that was taken from the book, the Dead Sea Scrolls, a new translation. Now I will link the book in the description box below. Today, we are gonna be talking about the Essenes and their Dead Sea Scrolls, one scroll in particular. This is going to be part three of our discussion on the scenes or the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you have not seen part one or two, I'm going to link those videos down below. I would suggest that you watch those first. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. I hope you guys enjoyed our video on Saturday with Tiffany Monroe, one of our producers here at Esoteric Atlanta. If you guys would like for us to show more meditation videos from Tiffany as bonus videos on Saturday, let us know. Also, again, if you would like to get in touch with Tiffany regarding her services, then follow the links listed again below. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we are going to be talking about the final battle between the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. As always, this is a follow-up of the discussion we had on the Dark Outpost TV yesterday with David Zublik. If you would like to see a more thorough discussion of this episode, then please link down to the website below and join the inner circle. The War Scroll was, again, one of the scrolls that we classify as the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is also called the Rule of War. Well, this scroll was one of seven scrolls found in the first cave back in Qumran in 1947 with our nomadic teenage shepherd boys. This scroll contains 19 columns. However, they think it originally had 20. This is good news because that means only a little bit of the scroll is missing. So therefore we have a thorough understanding of what was written in the war scroll. The war scroll is thought to be one of the Essenes most important documents. If you can remember from our prior videos on the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls, this group of people are thought to maybe be what became the Christian faith. However, the Essenes or the Sons of Light lived a pretty different life than what we see in Christianity today. If you remember back from our Constantine video, you will know that Constantine the Great wasn't so great and pretty much changed the original Christian faith into a Canaanite faith of Mithraism. And again, I will place that Constantine, a link to that Constantine video down below if you have not seen it. Well, the Essenes were very, very, very devout. They lived in a community that was secluded from the rest of civilization. They did not particularly like the Pharisees or the Sadducees, the other two groups of Jewish people at that time. When one became an Essene, one gave up its material possessions. For example, in the excavated caves, they have found jars of money 
thought to belong to certain members of the Essenes who stored it away because within the community, money was not needed. Their priests did not get married. However, people living within the community could get married and the community took to raising their children. The Essenes were really good to old people and they often brought orphans in to their communities as well. The Essenes were known to be heavy fasters. They also were very mystical. They used divination. They studied the stars. They prophesied a lot. They fasted a lot. For them, the act of religion, the laws of Moses at that time, were more of a practice than a dogma. And of course, as we've stated in a prior video, it is thought that John the Baptist was potentially an Essene. Baptism was a huge part of the Essene culture and practices, the anointing. And it was also believed that Jesus Christ himself was either an Essene or lived with the Essenes at some point. We do also know that the original apostles were affected by the Essenes. This is clear from some references in the Bible. Well, with the particular war scroll, we have a description of the seventh and final battle for Armageddon or the end of time. Now, historians have two main thoughts with the war scroll. Many historians believe that the war scroll was a, dis a description of the coming Jewish war that happened in 66 AD. However, other historians aren't so sure. They believe that the war scroll is actually a book that was supposed to accompany the book of Revelation from the Bible. In fact, the war scroll was written long before Revelation was written. Of course, we see references to the end of days throughout the Bible, especially in the book of Ezekiel. But none are more apocalyptic than Revelation itself, which is the last book of the Bible. Now, interestingly enough, talking about banned books in the Dead Sea Scroll, the book of Revelation was banned from the Bible at one point and then brought back again and then banned again. The main argument I found for this is that they didn't know who John actually was, the guy who was responsible for the book of Revelation. Many biblical scholars thought it might have been John from the Gospels, while as others thought it was a completely different John. The ones that thought it was a different John believed that that is why Revelation should not be a part of the Bible. For me, that makes no sense. I mean, there's lots of people named John. Do we have to have just one John? It it just doesn't make sense to me. We also know that Revelation is one of the most confusing books to read. Here we have this man who is prophesizing about the end of time, but he's seeing things that are about 2,000 years away from him, so he really has no idea how to describe what he's seeing. Revelation can invoke a lot of fear in people, and of course, many churches and religious organizations have used Revelation to scare people into becoming a member of their church. In my opinion, that's abuse. But spiritual abuse is rampant all over the world. It's not something that's exclusive to the Christian religion at all. Well, as we've moved into what many people believe now is the end of time as written about in the Bible, we're starting to understand Revelation a little differently. We don't see it as as scary as we once thought it was. We're realizing that the tribulation, that all these awful things aren't happening to the good people, to the Christians or the people of light. They're going to be happening to the people of darkness. And this is really clear to me in the War Scroll. Where Revelations is more complicated to read, the War Scroll is pretty cut and dry and very fascinating. The War Scroll, again, describes the seventh and final battle between the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. Now, the Essenes called themselves the Sons of Light. In the War Scroll, they make it clear that the Sons of Light are Jewish and Gentile people, which is pretty big to write back in those days as a Jewish person that there would be Gentiles joining you amongst this battle. It also refers to the genetic line of the Sons of Light. These are the sons of Levi, the sons of Judah, and the sons of Benjamin. If you've joined us on the Dark Outpost either last night or a couple of weeks ago, you would know that our current president is of the sons of Judah. 
Well, the war scroll goes on to talk about three stages of battles. The first stage would involve a group called Kittim. Now it is believed that Kittim describes the Roman Empire. Many historians also say it could just basically mean a generic bad guy. In my personal opinion, I think it's pretty liberal, meaning the Roman Empire. We know that the Vatican is super corrupt. We know that the Pope is like a really bad dude, if you know what I mean, involving bad things with children. Like we know that now, he's not good. And the Vatican itself has a room dedicated to Lucifer in its basement. You don't need me to go on and talk about everything the Vatican's been involved with because you probably know if you're watching this show. And so I think that Kittim is representative of the Vatican, of the Holy Roman Church. It goes on to say that in this first stage, Kittim will make alliances with enemies or violators of the covenant. I actually went and looked up what exactly it meant to be a violator of the covenant. And I found a very interesting verse in Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 11.10 and it says, they have gone back to the evil ways of their ancestors of old who refused to obey what I told them. They too have set allegiances to other gods and worshiped them. We know that throughout the Bible, the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, and the Christian Bible, there is a common theme of a battle between the Israelites and the Canaanites. Again, we broke this down on David's channel when we studied a deep history of the Canaanites. Basically, the Canaanites are people who worship multiple gods or worship through the act of human sacrifice. This is people who worship Moloch or Baal or Lucifer himself, where the Israelites are people who worship one God. That would be the people of Jewish faith or of Christian faith, which we discovered was the Essenes or is the Essenes. So therefore the Christian faith is the Judeo-Christian faith. The Essenes also wrote that the sons of light would be exiled into the wilderness. Looking at what we know about the genetic lines today of these particular families, I take that to mean that the sons of light that would be instrumental in this final battle would not be from the Middle East, that their family had immigrated to Europe or Asia or wherever. We know that our current president is not of Jewish origins, his mother was from Scotland. And we know that through his mother's line, that is where we can trace it back to the line of Judah. So in my opinion, I think the Essenes knew that when the last days would come, that the good guys, the sons of light, would no longer be living in Qumran, where they lived at this time. It is also said in the War Scroll that these Sons of Light, the head of the military force against the Sons of Darkness, would basically move the temple to Jerusalem. We see this with the moving of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem just recently. During the second stage of the final battle, we see Kedem and Kedem's alliances with its enemies moving into Egypt and into the kings of the north. I take this to mean that they moved down into Africa and basically just pilgrimed through Africa, which we know that they did, and they went up into Europe and made alliances with all these royal families. These royal families themselves are Phoenician families. Again, please refer back to our episode on the Canaanites in the Dark Outpost. It states that for 40 years, the Sons of Darkness would be in battle with the Sons of Light before getting to the final battle. This I can absolutely believe. I'm 37 years old. I'm three years away from 40. We know that the um, Georgia Guidestones were put up about 40 years ago. We understand that this war that's happening now isn't as outright as wars have been in the past that it's more under the surface. And I believe for most of my life, these final battles have been happening. But again, it's the final battle, the seventh battle that the Essenes go into more detail in their war scroll. By this point, they say, say that the six other battles that have happened previously have left them in a tie, a deadlock. The Sons of Darkness and the Sons of Light are at a three to three tie. 
But by the final and seventh battle, we see the Essenes point directly to the hand of God coming in to help the sons of light move into victory. It is also talked about there being earthly soldiers as well as heavenly soldiers. I personally take this to mean angels and potentially other alien life force like the Palladians. In the war scroll, it says specifically, the great hand of God shall overcome Balial and the demons of his dominion, and all the men of his force shall be destroyed. Now, Balial is a Hebrew word meaning the wicked, basically. Now, the war scroll goes on to say that after the final battle, when the sons of darkness have been defeated, there will be a huge feast of thanksgiving. It is also told us in the war scroll that the sons of darkness will cease to exist. They will be exiled and kicked basically off of the planet. This backs up the new research in the book of Revelation. It's not us that's going through the tribulation. It's the wicked that are going through the tribulation. Joe M created a video a long time ago. In one of his lines, he says, I am not a cr criminal. You are not a criminal. Most of us are good people. Most of us are sons of light. The sons of darkness are a very minute group of humanity, but they're very powerful. So basically, that's good. That means that we're coming to the end stages of darkness. We know that this winter solstice is coming up that Juniper and Saturn will be at zero degrees Aquarius. This apparently hasn't happened since Jesus was born when they were at zero degrees Pisces. And I will include a link down below to a Christian article that talks about how the alignment of these planets might mimic the star of Bethlehem. This means that we're moving into the a thousand years of peace as promised after the end times. It'll be us enjoying our planet though, not them. Some other interesting insights into the war scrolls go as follows. It says that the sons of light are led by the Prince of Light, who is Archangel Michael. The Bible also refers to Michael as the chief prince. The Bible also says Michael will play a significant part in the end times in Revelation. The war scrolls state that the heads of houses will gather and decide who they will fight with. To me, this refers to bloodlines, the bloodlines of the Illuminati, or perhaps the heads of nations. The war scrolls also state that whole congregations shall fight together in the last days. To me, this is referring to what we know as the Alliance, or the White Hats. We know this by the infamous poster that started posting back in 2017, if you know what I mean. I can't say it on YouTube, but you guys know what I mean. That all these people around the world, all these different heads of military and countries that are sons of light are working together to help humanity, to beat the sons of darkness. It's kind of eerie how the war scrolls are basically an outline of what's happening right now. So what we get from the scrolls is that this is a time of salvation for the people of God. And for the sons of darkness, there will be absolutely no escape. So we know that the sons of darkness, we know who they are, these globalists, that they're trying really, really, really hard to derail humanity, to derail these sons of light. People often ask, well, if these prophecies were true, then why would they be fighting so hard? Because they're trying to rewrite the script. This is exactly what Lucifer did in the first battle. When he first rejected God, he tried to change the narrative, to change the story. And these sons of darkness are so arrogant that they believe that they have the power to totally change the course of human trajectory, human's future. We know that we're coming into the age of Aquarius and there is nothing that these people can do about it because their God is not as powerful as our God. Now, at the end of this video, I am going to read you the letter that Archbishop Vigano wrote to our president a few months ago. It's super fascinating because in this letter, Archbishop Vigano refers to the children of light and the children of darkness. In my opinion, the children of light and the children of darkness are exactly the same people because a son is a child. They don't say the men of darkness or women of darkness. It's the sons 
the children. But before we go into Vigano's letter, I want to let you guys know that starting next week on The Dark Outpost, we are going to be leaving the Dead Sea Scrolls behind and we are going to be moving into the other books of the Bible. The book of the Bible that was banned that I want to start with is the book of Thomas. Now, before we get into some of these books, we are going to have to talk about the Gnostics and the Cathars. I know that's really triggering to a lot of Christians and it doesn't mean that you have to agree with the Gnostics or the Cathars, but we do need to look at what they believed because we do understand the original Christian faith was a little bit more mystical than the Canaanites turned the Christian faith into. Of course, I will do a follow-up on the Gnostics and the Cathars next Wednesday after our episode airs on the Dark Outpost. Now, as far as the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls that we haven't spoken about in this episode, I have found that a lot of them do correlate with some of the banned books from the Bible. So as we get to each banned book, as we go through it, and there is a correlation with the Dead Sea Scroll, then I will link the two together. But for next week, we're gonna leave them behind and again, focus on the Gnostics and the Cathars. Please leave me your opinions in the comment box below. Again, if you would like to purchase our opening song, then there's a link to that, as well as following a Todd Roderick's band, there's a link to the Flying Mystics as well. All right, guys, once again, as I sign off, I'm gonna leave you with the letter from Archbishop Vigano to our president here in the United States. This letter was written on June 7th of 2020. Mr. President, in recent months, we have witnessed the formation of two opposing sides that I would call biblical, the children of light and the children of darkness. The children of light constitute the most conspicuous parts of humanity, while the children of darkness represent an absolute minority. And yet the former are the object of a sort of discrimination which places them in a situation of moral inferiority with respect to their adversaries who often hold strategic positions in government, in politics, in the economy, and in media. In an apparently inexplicable way, the good are held hostage by the wicked and by those who help them out of their self-interest or fearfulness. These two sides, which have been biblical in nature, follow a clear separation between the offspring of woman and the offspring of the serpent. On the one hand, there are those who, although they have a thousand defects and weaknesses, are motivated by the desire, desire to do good and to be honest, to raise a family, to engage in work, to give prosperity to their homeland, to help the needy, and in obedience to the law of God, to merit the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, there are those who serve themselves, who do not hold any moral principles, who want to demolish the family and the nations, exploit workers to make themselves unduly wealthy, intern create internal divisions and wars, and accumulate power and money. For then the foulest illusion of temporal well-being will one day, if they do not repent, yield to terrible fate that awaits them, far from God, in eternal damnation. In society, Mr. President, these two opposing realities coexist as eternal enemies, just as God and Satan are eternal enemies, and appears to the children of darkness whom we may be easily identify as the deep state which you wisely oppose and which is fiercely waging war against you in these days, have decided to show their cards, so to speak, by now revealing their plans. They seem to be so certain of already having everything under control that they have laid aside the circumspection that until now had at least partly concealed their true intentions. The investigations are all underway and re reveal the true responsibility of those who managed the virus emergency not only in the area of healthcare but also in politics the economy and the media we will probably find that in this colossal operation of social engineering there are people who have decided the fate of humanity arrogating to themselves the right to act against the will of citizens and their representatives in the governments of nations we will also discover that the riots in these days were provoked by those who seeing that the virus is an 
inevitability fading and that the social alarm of the pandemic is waning necessarily have had to provoke civil disturbances because they would be followed by repression which although legitimate could be condemned as an unjustified aggression against the population the same thing is also happening in europe in perfect synchrony it is quite clear that the use of street protests is instrumental in the purpose of those who would like to see someone elected in the upcoming presidential elections who embodies the goals of the deep state and who expresses those goals faithfully and with conviction. It will be surprising if in a few months we learn once again that hidden behind these acts of vandalism and violence, there are those who have profited from the dissolution of social order so as to build a world without freedom. Salve et Caligula, as the Masonic adage teaches. Although it may be disconcerting, the opposing alignments I have described are also found in religious circles. They are faithful shepherds who care for the flock of Christ. But there are also mercenary infidels who seek to scatter the flock and hand the sheep over to be devoured by the ravenous wolves. It is not surprising that these mercenaries are allies of the children of darkness and hate the children of light. Just as there is a deep state, there is also a deep church that betrays its duties and forswears its proper commitment before God. Thus, the invisible enemy, whom good rulers fight against in public affairs, is also fought against by good shepherds in ecclesiastical sphere. It is a spiritual battle which I spoke about in my recent appeal, which was published on May 8th. For the first time, the United States has a new president who courageously defends the right to life, who is not ashamed to denounce the persecution of Christians throughout the world, who speaks of Jesus Christ and the right of citizens to freely worship. Your participation in the March of Life, and more recently, your proclamation of the month of April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month are actions that confirm which side you wish to fight on. And I dare to believe that the both of us are on the same side in this battle, a bet with different weapons. For this reason, I believe that the attack to which you were subjected after your visit to the National Shrine of St. John Paul II is part of the orchestrated media narrative which speaks not to fight racism and bring social order, but to aggravate dispositions, not to bring justice, but to legitimize violence and crime, not to serve truth, but to favor one political fraction. And it is disconcerting that there are bishops such of those who I recently denounced, who by their words prove that they are aligned with the opposing side. They are subservient to the deep state, to globalism, to lang thought, to the new world order, which they invoke ever more frequently in the name of universal brotherhood, which has nothing Christian about it, but which evokes the Masonic idea of those who want to dominate the world by driving God out of the courts, out of school, out of families, and perhaps even out of churches. The American people are mature and have now understood how much the mainstream media does not want to spread the truth, but seeks to silence and distort it, spreading the lie that is useful for the purpose of their masters. However, it is important that the good, who are the majority, wake up from their sluggishness and do not accept being deceived by a minority of dishonest people with a purpose. It is necessary that the good, the children of light come together and make their voices heard. What more effective way is there to do this Mr. President than by prayer, asking the Lord to protect you, the United States and all of humanity from this enormous attack of the enemy. Before the power of prayer, the deceptions of the children of darkness will collapse. Their plot will be revealed. Their betrayal will be shown. Their frightening power will end in nothing, brought to light and exposed for what it is, an infernal deception. Mr. President, 
my prayer is constantly turned to the beloved American nation, where I had the privilege and honor of being sent by Pope Benedict as a nuncio. In this dramatic and decisive hour for all of humanity, I am praying for you and also for all those who are at your side in the government of the United States. I trust the American people are united with me and you in prayer to Almighty God, united against the invisible enemy of all humanity. I bless you and I bless the First Lady and the beloved American nation and all men and women of good will.